So coming back to uh, Meta Bhavana, from the awareness of yourself, and you feel that you need to transcend yourself. And now here you have a mean to do that. Next you amplify yourself by including the dearest person. Yes, the so-called self becomes bigger. You relate to it. For instance, you think of your mother. You have deep love for your mother. In the same stage, the mother is the object of your radiation and loving kindness. First, in the first stage, your, your, your loving kindness is for yourself and you need to start from there. And that is also, as I said, the awareness of your self-identity. And then now, the second stage, you expand it. You relate. You also fulfill at the same time your self-relatedness. How do you do the relation? Through what Eric Fromm recognizes as a positive way, that is love. You feel love for the dearest person. Then you want to explain it further to even the neutral person, the third stage, and to the first to the so-called enemies. And then finally to all sentient beings. So when you look at the practice of Metta Bhavana in this way, you can see that it's a concrete way to be aware of human needs and not only that, not only just awareness. This is actually a mindfulness, ex mindfulness meditation actually. We look at it in this way. Huh? But at the same time also, it is the actual solution to it through love. Ultimately, if one succeeds at the highest stage of in this meditation, one becomes a true individual. At the same time, one transcends individuality and one becomes related to the totality of sentient beings. And one actually at that highest stage, one gains wisdom, gain insight. Inside of what? Inside of no selfness. Inside of in Buddhist term emptiness. There's no separation between me and others. So in this way, the example of uh, Metta Bhavana shows you that Buddhism provides a practice of mindfulness or awareness of human needs in the most direct way. Plus, it provides the actual practice to fulfill that need. That's why Buddhist practice is universally relevant. Uh, likewise, now we don't have time, it's, uh, a lot of time has been spent now, just one more example. Likewise, uh, we have, for instance, in the puja, the practice of uh, rejoicing in marriage, uh, and the practice of, uh, of transferring or sharing marriage with our sentient beings. Now you can see that these practices are concrete ways. First of all, once again, uh, to cultivate uh, the awareness of human needs. We cannot be just happy by yourself. You must, you must feel happy that others are happy. Then in that way, you are positively relating to others. You find rooted in humanity, in the whole of humanity. Just now I talk about uh, the, the, the commitment the sense of responsibility and acting on that sense of responsibility of glorifying your own uh, religious Buddhist cultural tradition. That is also a solution to the need for rootedness. That's why I emphasize the need to 
to find the roots and that is also a way to transcend the individuality of yourself and the individuality of your your particular cultural group. If you are Chinese, you must be able to go beyond your Chineseness. First, you must be able to relate to your Chinese through love, not through hatred. I find it very sad to, to see some people, you know, uh, maybe in Hong Kong or other places, they reject their Chinese tradition and they, they hold the flags of uh, the English or whoever, the Westerners, you see. Uh, now, I, I'm not political at all. I, I do, I'm not expressing political view. But I, I'm certain that, spiritually speaking, these people do not seem to but learn the tradition. I mean, if you, if you find within that system a potential tradition, that's understandable, it's actually good. But if you say, no, I want to be English, English is better for me and not Chinese. That is something that I really can't understand because uh, you are escaping from the need of rootedness. So that's why I emphasize all to my uh, young uh, student disciples that even if they go to other countries in Agarjo, they mustn't forget their root. That is not a question of just a moral application, but is a question of your own survival as a human being. A question of your own overcoming your human need as a human being. We all have the need of rootedness and we must care for it and act on it. So uh, coming back to this uh, the practice of rejoicing in other metta, you expand yourself, you transcend yourself. You know that you are free. You can, you can, you can make yourself happy and make others happy. You can be happy that others are happy. When others have problems, you must feel that you have to share this problem. In that way, you are not just sacrificing yourself. As I very often said, Buddhism is not a religion of self-denial. Buddhism is not a religion that emphasizes sacrifice. I don't apologize uh, for my different type of explanation of, of Buddhism as I understand uh, from the exposition by others, uh, teachers and scholars. My it's yourself, and you must always be able to relate that 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 relatedness, that need for for relatedness, that need for for rootedness, the need to transcend yourself, the need to find yourself identities, the need to find a frame of reference. All these are together, and this causes you a human needs. So coming back to that that that, that act, the practice of rejoicing and merit is a very very important practice you find fulfillment of your human needs. Because by doing that, you relate through love. You find your rootedness as human beings. You find your sense of brotherhood or sisterhood. That's very important. Western society teaches us a different form of conception of individuality. I am the more important. Why should I be doing this for others? Why should I? Why should I? You keep on asking yourself. Eh? And you can keep on thinking that you are more important than others. Now, the type of individuality we are talking about is the true individuality in which you feel united with humanity, with the whole of sentience. And this is also through the example of rejoicing the marriage of others and sharing others' problems. And also in the example of uh, transfer of marriage, you amplify your the meaning of your existence. The whole of our human problems, of all cycle of problems, the root of it, 
is the lack of meaning of existence. That's where the so-called religious need comes in. That point is underscored by people that are from. But you can see that this is actually the teaching of Buddhism also. Even when you do a simple act of a wholesome nature, you think, you understand that, yeah, there is a law of moral nature, a law of karma that, that determines yeah, cause and effect. But I, I am free to choose that. You feel the sense of freedom and you face it. You face your sense of responsibility. You don't run from it. But you amplify it. On the other hand, to infinity. Again, there is no halfway, halfway path. You feel that whatever good I have, that's going to be an effect. This is the, this is a form of de determination of moral law. But I, my part is to use my freedom as a human being, as a sentient being, to make moral choices which will, which will bring about wholesome, good, if you like, effects. I'm not speaking in very strict philosophical way. Huh? Beneficial effects. And this effect is not just for myself, but for all sentient beings. All means all. Not only just myself, not only just my dearest ones, not only my beloved ones only, my acquaintances only, but all sentient beings. So when you can relate like this, you infinitely amplify the meaning of existence. When you can find through meaning of existence in this most thorough going way, most fundamental way, then you actually fulfill your need as a human being. Your individuality becomes merged with universality. So through the practice of transfer merit, you can see you cultivate this awareness of human needs. The, in fact, you also become aware that when all sentient beings are benefited, you are the one that is benefited also. You're not denying yourself. You're not denying your own needs. But your need becomes infinitely meaningful when it becomes also the need of others that is being fulfilled. So these are a few examples to show you that in the Buddhist teaching, in the Buddha's teaching, and also as I said, not only today, I don't have time to go on to others and also about the examples of Buddha's life, but you can use examples to find your own way to understand from his teaching and from his personality, how he struggled, why he wanted to leave the home life, why he wanted to search for enlightenment, and so on to understand human needs. Uh, put in the form of five for human needs or Eric forms, or perhaps uh, in the form of uh, basic needs and meta needs of uh, Maslow and so on. Uh, you can see that actually this teaching by modern psychologists, humanist psychologists, have been better and more concretely taught by the Buddha in Buddhism. And not only that, not only taught, but there are ways that are relevant irrespective of time. Today, tomorrow, the relevant will still remain and there are 
more effective way, most thoroughgoing, more concrete ways for us to fulfill our human needs.